Hi there, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. This is part two of my Commodore 64s from Lincoln City Repair Series. This will be the final part where we take a look at the third board and then revisit the first board to try to fix that strange 6526 fault that it's having. All right, let's get right to it. All right, we're back to board number three. This is the one that when we put dead test in, we're getting flashing that's indicating that this RAM chip is bad. This is the board that has nothing in sockets except for the VIC-2, and I've already gone ahead and removed the RF shield off the bottom to prepare for desoldering of chips. So I'm still getting two flashes on the dead test cartridge, and I'm gonna warm up the desoldering iron, and I'm gonna remove this RAM chip right here. This is the one that indicated it was bad according to the dead test documentation, and while I'm at it, I'm gonna remove the PLA and I'm gonna remove the SID chip. The PLA, because there's a good chance that this might be faulty as well, so it's good to have that in a socket. And I'm gonna remove the SID because if this works, it might be useful to use it on a different machine anyways. So I was looking at the back of this board to see if there was any rework done. And this board's in really good shape generally. But looking at an angle, I can tell that one chip has been reworked, and it's this RAM chip right here. They did a really good job. They cleaned up all the flux, but the soldering is just not the same as every single other chip on the board. And that chip definitely looks suspect. So when we flip the board over, which chip is it that got desoldered? This one right here. I noticed the pen mark on it. That's the one that was indicated as bad. And check out the brand. MT, Micron Technologies. All the rest of the RAM chips are NECs, but this is an MT. Now I didn't notice this initially, but if I had seen that this was an MT RAM chip and the dead test cartridge is telling us that that chip is bad, I am almost for sure certain that this chip is a problem. But we're gonna find out when we yank it off. So I just wanted to point that out before I do it. And through the magic of editing, I've removed those three chips. The bad RAM chip, well, the one I think is bad, and the PLA and the SID chip. This motherboard was really easy to desolder these three chips. Some motherboards are a lot easier than others. Not really sure what the reason for that is, but almost 100% of the solder came out. A little bit of hot air is all I needed, and those chips just popped right out. So I have the sockets installed in this board. Even though we haven't even tested yet, I've cleaned up all the flux off the back of the board, so it looks all nice and factory fresh all over again. Although Commodore would never use these types of sockets, that would imply spending a few extra cents, and you know, they did everything they could to cut as many cents off as possible. Okay, so I have a new RAM chip here. Let's pop this into this socket. All right, PLA is in, extra RAM chip is in. I'm gonna pull out the dead test cartridge. We are gonna see if this thing just boots straight into basic. Are we ready? This is the moment of truth. Oh, oh, nearly there, nearly there. There could be a problem with the PLA, but there could also be a problem with the character ROM. A blue screen with no text when you boot into basic really could indicate a character ROM problem. So we can get a good idea what's going on with the dead test cartridge because the character ROM is not used when you use dead test. So let's pop this into the computer, just see what happens. I do have to say that the blue screen is a great sign with this replaced RAM chip on here. That MT RAM chip, okay, there we go. All right, so it came up and you notice the characters all look good. And that's again, because it's not using the onboard character ROM. So this character ROM may well be faulty. So I might have to suck that out. Let's let this run through a full diagnostic. Okay, it passed all of the tests, sound test, the SID's not even installed, but at least from a dead test perspective, all of the chips are good. We have a good set of RAM and probably a really well, good working PLA. I'm gonna reconfigure this from dead test to the regular diag test. And I have these little dip switches on here and I just switch it to two and five right there. And this is the standard diag cartridge. This one requires the ROM chips to be working. So when we turn this on, probably gonna have a blank screen with no characters. Oh, we actually have working characters as well. Well, let's let this run through See what this gives an error on. All right, now it's saying the basic ROM is bad. So I guess it's not the character ROM because we're getting letters, but basic is bad. So I guess it's just crashing instead of booting up properly into basic. 
more magical editing and I have a socket installed and this is the basic ROM that I've removed from the computer. So if we turn this on now, we should just get a blue screen, which is exactly what we were getting before. Okay, and there's no cartridge in here. 901-22601, this is the basic ROM I removed. There's really only one basic ROM that was ever used on all the Commodore 64s. It's all the same version two. It's basically, the PET even has a better version. I think the PET goes up to version four. They kind of lock this one at version two. So I have a replacement basic ROM here. Let's pop this in, turn it on. And we have basic, okay. So that clinches it. This ROM is bad, big old X. So I wanna run the diagnostics using the diagnostic harness just to make sure all of these chips are good, but the user port and the tape port look absolutely horrible. So it's time to try something that viewers have been recommending for a while, and it's Brasso. This is a metal polish, and I'm gonna to try to polish these metal contacts, see if this thing works well for me. Never used this before, so I'm gonna squirt some on a cotton swab here. Ooh, I put way too much on. Well, that's amazing. Look at that. That's made that really nice and shiny. Let's try on this cassette port, which is in pretty sad shape. Okay, I'm shocked. That's that's made a giant difference. Wow. Let's attack the bottom here. All right, that's shocking. Those are shiny and they look amazing now. I'll just clean this up. I have some isopropyl alcohol on this uh, paper towel. And I'll just wipe this clean so I get off any Brasso residue that might be still on these connectors. The cassette port has seen better days. There's a little bit of corrosion still on there, but I don't think there's too much I'm gonna be able to do about that. I don't think it's gonna cause any kind of issues anyways. All right, the diag cart is in. I have the harness connected, everything is plugged in. Keyboard loopback is on. I have the original SID back in. I have the speaker hooked up, so we'll hear the audio output. And let's turn this on and see what happens. We have everything working, all okays. The SID is sounding a little off, but it was at least producing sound and not a lot of weird pops. I had a few extraneous little blips and noises and the sound on the noise channel was a little weird as well. But it might sound fine in games, so let's give that a try now because this machine appears to be fully functional now. All right, Easy Flash 3 is connected along with the keyboard and a game controller. So let's turn this on. All right, we get the Easy Flash 3 menu. Let's try my good old standby, Donkey Kong Arcade. All right, there we go. All right, I turned the volume down. This is obviously working fantastically. The SID sounds absolutely fine playing the Donkey Kong intro there. So there have been times when I've had a SID that is working okay with a diagnostic cartridge, seems fine there. But when you play an actual game, you get glitchiness and other strange sounds. That's not the case with this one. It's working great. So let's get out the old pen and start marking up the chicks. So both 6526s work perfectly. This uh, basic ROM that I installed is working fine. Kernel ROM is great. Character ROM is good. CPU is working perfectly. This PLA works perfectly. This SID is working seemingly perfectly. And the VIC, I've already marked uh, a check mark on that. That is working great. And this little RAM chip that we've installed, that is working perfectly now as well. So. In summary, board number three, bad empty RAM chip, as if anyone is surprised, and a bad basic ROM. Otherwise, we're looking good. 
Okay, I wanted to revisit board number one. This is the first one we looked at that pretty much worked, except for that one error where it said interrupt when I was using the diagnostic uh, cartridge and the test harness. So what I did is the diagnostic cartridge said U2 might be problematic. So I've gone ahead and socketed that chip. And let's run this test again, just to make sure that error is still happening. And then we'll swap this chip with another known good one, see if that error goes away. I've also brassoed these two connectors, so they look nice and shiny now. All right, let's see what happens when we turn this thing on. Currently has one of the poppy bad SID chips in there, so when this runs the sound test, we'll hear lots of popping as opposed to the tones we should be hearing. All right, we're still getting bad on the interrupt test with U2 being the problem. Let's turn the speaker up. Same problem with the SID, you just barely hear it, and then lots of popping noises. Okay. Let's swap this chip U2 with a known good one to see if that problem goes away. This chip came out of my Ziff machine. It's the one I leave in there permanently and it does work properly. Although originally I pulled this out of a 128 thinking it was not working correctly, but this was before I had the diagnostic test harness. And I think there might've been a different fault with that machine. And this, this chip was actually fine. So it has a check mark, but I have an M on here for marginal. All right, we're still getting bad on the interrupt U2. So it's definitely not a problem with this uh, 6526 chip. So I'm glad I didn't throw this away or cut the legs off it. It's actually a good chip. So there's some other fault on here. I'm gonna have to figure out what exactly interrupt is on this diagnostic test and see if we can find out where that fault lies. Okay, let's look at the schematics to try to troubleshoot this board. So right here is U2, which is the chip that it's saying is bad. I have obviously socketed it and it's still having a problem. Now it's saying interrupt is bad and IRQ is pin 21 right here. That is the interrupt line on that U2 chip. It's hooked up to the NMI signal, which is the non-maskable interrupt. That signal goes up here all the way to the 6510 CPU. It's also pulled up to five volts right here through this 3.3K resistor pack three. But when we look down at the bottom, this does go to the cartridge port, but in this case, it's not being used. But you'll see this little bit of electronics right here. There's a 7406, which is U8, and here is the triple five or 556 timer. And what this is doing is if we follow this trace up here, is this is going to the restore key. So on the 64, when you push restore, it actually generates a non-maskable interrupt. And that is buffered by this electronics right here. So the 556 ensures that your quick press is held for a little bit longer. This is like a little bit of a debounce circuitry. And then this is a buffer and it goes up to the CPU and it sends the non-maskable interrupt. When you hit run, stop and restore together, kind of does a soft reset of your 64. But those are the only things that are hooked up to that line. Now I made a little cheat sheet here just to show me all the components that are involved and the signals. So the U8, U20, U2, U7, and resistor pack three. I want to just double check that everything was looking good. Now I've gone ahead and done that and all of the signals have correct continuity. So when taking a look at the 7406, which is this chip right here, pin six is indeed connected to the interrupt line on the 6526, and it also is going to the non-maskable interrupt on the CPU. And actually on this board, holding uh, run, stop, and restore correctly resets this machine. So that circuitry is working correctly. Here's the manual for the diagnostic cartridge. And as you see, we're in section 5.15, interrupt test. And this talks about what this diagnostic is actually doing. It indicates here the diagnostic instructs the 6526 at both U1 and U2 to generate an IRQ and a non-maskable interrupt. That is picked up by the CPU, and if it's not, then it is shown as bad. It also does something with the alarms and the timers, and then it generates non-maskable interrupts, and if there's a problem there, it also gets a bad. And then the final section here, I don't exactly know what this means. The data light interrupt is tested by outputting on the 6526CIA-U2 and waiting for an interrupt to occur on the 6526CIA-U2. Sorry, U1 and U2. Data is then output on a 6526U2 and a check is done for interrupt to occur on U1. If the interrupt occurs, the interrupt is shown as okay on the diagnostic and if it's not sensed, it's bad. 
So what I did off camera is I used my oscilloscope to check the interrupt lines on both of these chips and the interrupt line on the CPU and everything looks absolutely perfect. I'm seeing pulses of the interrupt lines coming out of both of these CIAs and it's shown on the pins on the CPU. And just to reiterate, I've replaced the CPU with a known good one and that also has no effect on that diagnostic test. I also took my ZIF64 and connected the diagnostic test harness to it, ran the diagnostic, and everything passes that test perfectly. And I used the oscilloscope to check all the signals while it's running the test in that interrupt section, and it looks exactly the same as this board. The only thing I'm thinking is that maybe there's a bug or a slight error in the diagnostic, and it's saying that U2 is bad when in fact U1 is faulty. So I hate doing this because I like to understand what the fault is on the machine before I just remove chips, but I'm really at a loss for the fault I'm having right now with this. So it's time to heat up the desoldering iron because I'm taking the 6526 out and I'll put it in a socket so I can test this in another machine and we'll see if this changes the fault behavior at all. Okay, I've removed the chip and it's right here. I have the Ziff's machine all connected to the test harness. Let's put this one into the same position that it came out of on this machine. So right here into U1. Plug the keyboard test loop back back in and let's turn this on. I just ran the diagnostics a second ago before I switched the chip and everything was testing perfect on this machine. No failures whatsoever. Oh boy, interrupt tested okay. I am completely at a loss. All right, well I'm gonna reinstall this back in the board of course with pin headers so it's removable in the future. Well, three Commodore 64 boards that are all clean and working really well now. This one here had the most faults. It had two bad RAM chips and a bad 6526 that was preventing it from working and it had a bad SID. So lots going on here. But now it does work fine now that I've changed out the RAM. I am missing a 6526 though, so I'm actually out of spares. Anyways, this one here, which originally had all the chips soldered on it, has less faults. It had a working SID, which is thumbs up to that, but it had a bad MT RAM chip, which I've replaced and works, and it had a bad basic ROM that prevented it from booting. So this machine is now restored. And finally, that leaves us with board number one, which only had a bad SID originally, but otherwise worked. And it has that weird fault where the interrupts show bad from the 6255s, but I've been playing games on it. That's why I have my SDIEC plugged in here and everything seems to be working absolutely fine on this board. I can't find any problems with actual software operation. So if you have an idea what might be the failure, I would love to hear it down in the comments section because I am totally at a loss. This is the first time I've ever worked on a 64 that I couldn't completely fix it. So there you go. I guess even Adrian gets stumped once in a while. All right, there you have it. This is the end of the repair series. If you enjoyed it, you know what to do. You can hit a thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do as well. You can hit that thumbs down button, subscribe for more videos. And I definitely love to hear your comments and suggestions in the comment section below, especially if you have a hunch on what that fault is with this 64 board, which is the one that has that strange interrupt fault. I just can't figure it out because this machine seems to work perfectly in normal use, but yet diagnostics show an error. So anyways, if you know what it is, put your comment down below. I'd love to hear it. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.